extremely um, pleased to welcome this week's speaker, uh, Segalin Tapt, who asked me to pronounce her name the French way, um, and um, is, um, is a uh, senior research fellow in uh, Oxford at the Oxford Research Centre, and um, has a background, um, has been working for several years in, in various classics um, projects, particularly around imaging um, uh, ancient uh, textual artifacts, but her own background is in um, biomedical um, technology, and um, I believe her PhD involved breaking people's hips and things. Um, so really has the kind of collaborative background that, um, that digital classicist um, uh, feeds on, and is going to speak to us today about uh, cognition and the digital in the study of ancient textual artifacts. Thank you, Jim. So yes, as Gabby said, my, uh, my background is biomedical engineering. I started doing image processing, and that will become quite apparent um, in, the, in what's coming here. How, not why I made the transition, but how this transition has actually, how coming from where I come has helped me a lot in what I'm doing right now. So, um, to start with, I will talk about knowledge creation as an act of interpretation. Um, basically, I will give the example of papyrology, and I will actually also claim that digital is not neutral, because digitization, the act of digitization is already part of the act of interpretation. Uh, when we're looking at, uh, um, in particular, when we're looking at ancient textual artifacts. Then I will move on to talk about those cognitive processes, that, cogn that cognitive aspects that I've been looking at around um, what, it, what it means and what it is to interpret ancient textual artifacts. And I'll go through some perceptual processes and through some conceptual processes, and then I shall conclude. So, I probably don't need to spend much time with this audience on what papyrology actually is. Um, as you know, it's about producing a transcription and an interpretation of a textual document. What, what impresses me, I've been working with papyrologists for a while now, and um, I was reminded last weekend why I like papyrology so much. It has, it has something, um, it really cuts across all the granularities of um, the, the, the various levels of granularity of the construction of history. So basically you start at the very personal level with texts that have been written by an individual and that gives you an insight into what might have happened to that individual and then that, that gives you some, some insight on what happened to the community of which this individual was part of. And then it can actually help you um, argue new things about a, a more global historical so in terms of expertise, what do papyrologists as well as epigraphers, serologists and paleographers need for, for, for a skill? Well, and knowledge. They need some, some knowledge of ancient languages like Latin, Greek or Coptic, just as examples of some um, amongst many others. Um, they need some paleographical knowledge, the knowledge of letter shapes, of their evolution through time and, and, how, and how that influences the people who actually write. Um, knowledge of linguistics, occurrences of words, letters, typical formulae, all those kind of little elements that are clues to what the textual artifact that we are looking at are. Um, and then of course um, lexical fields and grammar that will also influence as to, as to making a decision about what kind of document, textual artifact, we are faced with. And then, of course, a knowledge of more general ancient history and archaeology to, to actually inform you on what the context of the textual artifact was. So, here is an example of why I'm saying that all this is interpretative. Well, some of you have probably already seen this, but this tablet that we have here, which is a, a Roman tablet that had been recessed, so there's a recess in, in the wood here, it was covered in wax, like one of those, um, and it was inscribed with a stylus like one of those, although I just popped into the British Museum before I came here and I can tell you they are much sharper than that, but feel free to circulate, do graffiti on it, you wouldn't be the first ones as you will see, um, but obviously those ancient textual artifacts when they come down to us, most of the time the wax has disappeared, so all that's left for papyrologists or epigraphers, as you want to call them, to read, is the scratches in the wood 
which constitute the text. So this specific one is, it used to be called the Frisian Ox tablet. Now what happened with this tablet is that it was first discovered, it was first edited in 1917 by Volgaf, who actually decided, well this is the Bill of Sale of One decided, transcribed it, traced it, and said, well it's the Bill of Sale of an Ox. And for him the word ox was here. That read Bowe. To read it that way, you need to rely on the blue tracing. The blue tracing is the 1917 tracing, and you can see that that black bit here, actually the descender here, was counted as an ascender on the line below. So that which with the black reads as a Q, red as a no, and the OM is pretty obvious, both in red, in black, and in no, and in blue. The B well can be discussed, you know. Uh, <laughs> But this tablet came to us in Oxford in uh, 2008, I think, where we, the idea was to get a clearer reading of the date. And looking at it, Alan Bowman, Roger Tomlin, and Klaus Vogt um, realized that actually this doesn't read Bowen at all, it reads Ad Bowen. So this is just an illustration that shows you that in terms of tracing, this is actually the commonality between the blue tracing and the black tracing. And you can see, I mean, there's not quite a heavy, there's not a, a too, too heavy a disagreement between the two. But in terms of the meaning, that's extracted from it. There's something, there's a real big gap. So if you look at just the tracing, you've got, you can actually somehow quantify the differences. And you've, it's, um, and, and you can see those numbers here, which, you know, it's, Okay, they don't completely agree, but you can't really say that they completely disagree. Now, if you look at the letter-by-letter letter transcription, with all what was thought to be abbreviations, especially in the 1917 transcription, then it becomes the gap becomes much bigger, and that also explains why um, why the um, so what's in green here is what what is in common between the two transcription and what's in black is what differs so this is why i'm saying i mean th the object was the same right they the papyrologists did their work on the same tablet and came up with two very different interpretations now one might be more correct than the other but then what is correct it's not like we've got a gold standard. It's not like we've got the right answer. So, papyrology is interpretative. Now, if you take that as a premise, it, and you, you, you don't really have access to your ancient documents, well, one of the things that most people do is digitize. And the thing about the digitization is that it is not it is also interpretative, simply because digitization, and that's why I call digital, uh, yeah, that's why I call what other people would call digital surrogates or digital facsimile. I call them avatars. The reason why I call them avatars is that ontologically they've got three very specific characteristics. One is that they're encoded. They're encoded both numerically, when we talk about digital avatars, but they're also encoded culturally. When you take a picture, you take it to see something specific, and if in, and if taking a picture wasn't interpretative, there wouldn't be art photography, right? So it is a certain perspective on the artifact. They're embedded into the real because they become part of your daily workflow in papyrology, where instead of working with the actual artifact, well, you start working with one of its digital avatars, one of them, right? Because you can have many photos and you can have many ways of digitizing. It could be 3D laser scanning, it could be infrared photography, it can be a number of, of, of those things. And also they influence the real because there have been occurrences where actually after, um, I'm thinking of an, of an epigraphy example for instance, where um, a fragment had been 3D scanned and first virtually reunited to the other bit it, it corresponded to before they, they were actually physically reunited. So that thing also influences the real in, in the same way that it's embedded into the real. I mean, the embedded and the influence are, are quite um, in, um, and, and enmeshed with each other. 
So in a sense, um, what those digital avatars do is that they express a certain form of presence of the artifacts. And from that point of view, quite a little bit strangely, um, what digitization does, um, instead of distantiating us from the materiality, it actually makes us realize that the materiality is important. So it, through that kind of rematerialization, um, then they are contingent on the intention of the act of digitization, and they all have an expected performative value. What, why do we take the pictures for? Why do we digitize for? What do we digitize for? So these are the kind of things that we need to be aware of when we do digitization, and that we need to document also so that people who want to reuse our digital avatars know what they were produced for in the first place. Now, why, why would I take some kind of a cognitive approach in the digital humanities, and how? Well, as Gabby said, I come, I come from the image processing arena, and I used to do image processing in the medical domain. And I was brought in onto this, on, on this project to do some image processing on this Fresinox tablet and on the Vindolanda tablet and such tablets. So what did I do? Well, I had my bag of algorithms from the medical imaging arena and I thought, well, I'm going to see what's in there and what can I do with that? And I tried to apply them. And it doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work because, well, the noise that you have in medical images is not the same kind of noise that the kind of noise you have on a textual artifact. The textual artifact is noisy for itself already. The stains, the abrasions, um, and it's not the same kind of noise as the noise in a medical image. In a medical image, we have a vague idea. We've got a model of how, what kind of noise is generated. We've got a model of what, what kind of physical um, phenomenon the, the imaging relies upon. There, well, we're relying on an optical phenomenon, on an artifact that's, well, it's in the state it is. I mean, you can't do much about it. So here, for instance, one of, the, one of the things that I was asked to do was to see if I could remove the wood grain. So I did that and ended up with this. That's the wood grain as I removed it. Now, the problem with that is that when I've removed all that, who says I didn't remove all the horizontal bars of the teeth, for instance? And the problem with that is that if I give you that and you don't know where the wood grain was, you can't even say, well, maybe that's not right, maybe it's more of a T because actually there's a wood grain here and maybe in there there was a horizontal bar of a T that's disappeared into a wood grain, into the wood grain. So, well, it could also be said that my algorithm wasn't sophisticated enough to do that. That, that would be a fair criticism. But it's, it's, the, it's one of the kind of things that, that needs to be taken into account when we, all those ready-made algorithms that do amazing stuff in other domains, they need not just adaptation, they need refactoring to actually match the domain of application. So that got me thinking, and I started, I actually sat in interpretation sessions with Alan Bowman, uh, Roger Tomlin, Roger Crowther, um, um, Charles Crowther, um, and, and I was just wondering how do they do what they do? How come do they see what they see? I don't seem to be able to teach my algorithms to tell them to find what they seem to be seeing without too much problem. It doesn't mean they can identify it all the time, but they seem to be seeing those scratches. What is it that makes them see them? So, basically, I took an ethnographic approach to, to, to that, and I, and I sat with them. Um, we actually recorded some of the sessions. I took some time to transcribe all those sessions, look at them specifically, and identify specific, some things that I thought were interesting phenomena that seemed to be pointing to what was happening. Um, and I tried to cross-reference that to the cognitive sciences literature, and that's again where my background in the, med in the medical imaging area came handy, because I, I'm kind of used to reading that type of articles and getting into the, I've got the statistical background, and, 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 and I, I'm slightly familiar with the uh, specific lexical fields that are, that are used also. 
So somehow this whole project, which actually was an early career fellowship funded by the AHRC, that's, that's how it all started. I started thinking, well, what is it that papyrologists do that makes them do what they do so well? So, first thing, perceptual processes, the materiality and digital avatars. And we've already talked about materiality um, 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 quickly when I talked about the, um, the scratches and the Roman tablets. But the thing is, when you've got a Roman tablet like this and you actually have physically access to it, what do you do? The text that you have is a 3D text. Instinctively, what everybody does is take the tablet, lift it up to eye level, and apply pitch and your motions to it. Why do we do that? Do you recognize that? The reason we do that is that by doing that, we make, we change the, the relative position of the, um, of the tablet and the eye with respect to the light. And what that does, it helps you to get depth perception. And this is something that Rogers and Brown have shown in 1982. They call it monocular parallax motion. So that would be with one eye. If you do that and, and that, you'll get the depth perception that stereopsis, so with two eyes, the depth perception that you would get with two eyes. Now, the reason why this is really interesting is that for all those 3D texts, like for those proteolomite tablets, like for um, epigraphical material, um, or for the um, cursed tablets, um, the text is usually 3D. So being able to emulate that depth perception without necessarily going through all the expense of 3D laser scanning is quite, is quite something. And this is exactly what, um, have you all heard of RTI, Reflectance Transformation Imaging? Well, it's basically, this is the kind of thing that you can do with it. So I, could, I can show a live demo a bit later if, you, if you're interested. But basically what it allows you to do is to interactively relight the artifact. The way we do that, and this is something that has been, a, that's so Matt Spender and um, Graham in Southampton has actually, um, we've collaborated with him to build a dome to actually be able to capture that. The dome in question, what it does is that You've got, instead of having, well, you actually have a fixed eye, a fixed tablet, and a dome over it with about 80 LED lights. And you take one picture for each light position. And then you interpolate. And then you can interactively simulate, um, uh, relight and simulate any light position. So that will help you, that, that is actually the digital Dependent of what we actually do when we lift the tablet at eye level. So this is one aspect, so that that, that visual process, that depth perception um, via monocular parallax motion, this is one of the things that is an intuitive strategy of interpretation that, um, that scholars adopt. Now, now I'd like to talk about the Artemidorus um, papyrus simply because there's a very interesting material aspect to what um, what Giambattista Nalesio, who works at King's, who's a great pathologist at King's, uh, discovered um, a couple of years back. Well, do you, does, do you all know about the Artemidorus papyrus? Yes, no, yes, yes, no. Um, the Artemidorus papyrus, originally I had written it's a controversial document. It's not really controversial anymore. One person is still convinced it's a 19th um, century forgery, but most people still that are convinced now that it's authentic. It has Greek text, bits of Greek text here, there. Um, it has sketches, there, a map, some portraits, and on the back, um, lots of fantastical, myth mythological, or real animals. Um, it's made of four segments. And um, they're quite, there are quite some um, um, hypotheses of how, what, what this document was, because it, it is quite intriguing to have all these elements within one papyrus. Um, the thing with this papyrus that is really interesting also is that nobody's really 
ever seen it. It's been exhibited a couple of times. Um, scholars don't really have access to it. All we have, access, all we have to work on is infrared and um, images, including infrared images of the of the papyrus, the front and the back. But what Jean Baptista discovered is that there seemed to be some mirror images that appeared um, on 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 one side of the document. It's actually the photo that was on the um, on the announcement for this seminar. I'll, I'll come to it in the next in the next slide. Um, but what that allowed me to do, so that I, I was approached to to help out, um, explain and justify why John Batista wanted to rearrange the fragments. What he wanted to do actually was to take this bit and put it there, um, based on what he was seeing here. So actually, if you look closely here, there, you will see the head of the panther that is here. And there, you might see the mirror image of the eye. And actually, I think I've got a bit of an animation here where you can, you can see. I mean, it's a fade in, fade out, so it's a bit of a cheat. But um, can you see there? Panther here, mm -hmm. and then the eye there. So, based on that discovery, he decided that one fragment had to be put to another at another place, and he wanted me to help him um, lay out a rigorous argument for that. So, what did I do? Well, the only thing I had were the infrared images. The first thing I had to do was to make the front correspond to the back. Because obviously, when you take the pictures of the front and of the back, they've been moved. So, if I try to, so that's a tiny fragment, a tiny loose fragment with a sketch on one side. That's the front, and that's the back. The photos as they were. Now, if I just simply overlay them, <laughs> you see it slowly appearing here. Those dot, those dots, it doesn't match. Those dots are supposed to match. So, I had to do some piecewise linear registration in order to have those fragments correspond to one another. So basically, what it corresponds to, imagine I have pins, and I want the black pins and the uh, white pins to correspond to one another. So I basically have that fixed on a board, and that I had to make it correspond to the pins there, so that I could actually have the the same shape for the front and for the back, which also means that, as you can imagine, that's not the back. That's actually the mirror image of the back, right? Because otherwise it would have been flipped around. But I still had to make them... This is as if I had been looking at it in transparency, the wrong way around, right? So I had to make those correspond to one another. Once I've done that, then what do I need to do? I need to figure out when it was rolled, how might have the mirror images occurred? So this is what I did. I said, well, let's imagine it was a perfect roll. It was a spiral. You've got all those numbers and scary stuff there which I don't really need to go through in, in detail. But based on some of those other um, measurements, some, some of those other mirror imaging that happened, you are actually, it was actually possible to measure the distance between the original image and its mirror imprint. And that would actually give you the length of one coil. Now I can show you what that means. This is what I mean, this is why I'm talking about materiality, right? Because when you're actually experimenting it for yourself, it makes so much more sense. Now I don't know if this is still in the state where it's, uh, no it's not, where it's easy to manipulate, but after I had done all those, all this work of making the front and the back correspond, I printed them all on here so that we could try and figure out if we could find those correspondences. So, it needs to be retightened and all that, and, but you, you, you can try for yourself. This is the panther, this is the bit of the eye, and this is 
a bit out of hand, and I feel like you can circulate it. It will probably fall to pieces. Um, don't worry, it's easy to remake, but have fun with it. Um, so, so basically, once I had done that, I could also measure the length of a specific coil and say, well, given the measurements, the distances that we have measured between the mirror image and the original image, this is the length of one coil, it's just one, one, yeah, one <coughs> coil of, of the spiral, and I can try and figure out whereabouts on the spiral that was, and this is why those numbers here are highlighted, those correspond to, or approximately correspond to some distances that have been measured on the papyrus. Um, and that can also tell us that there's quite a bit of the papyrus that's missing. If it had been, if, right, if it had been rolled tightly to the core, all the way to what we have, we're missing all the bits there in the middle. And that was amounting to a length of, I can't remember, it was, it was really long. I, 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 I would say this stupid number, so I'm not going to say a number, but it was, it was much longer than I would have expected. So here it is. If we actually reorder it, on the top we've got the front. Underneath it, we've got the mirrored version of the back, so the one that I used to, to do the correspondences, and that's the one that's flipped around when you actually look at, the, look at it the right way around and not tr through transparency. And what was really interesting with that also is that suddenly the ordering of all the fantastical and, and, and mythological animals on the back started to possibly make sense geographically, which they really didn't beforehand when that bit where is it? When that bit was located here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a bit that's the bit up there. That was originally your voice. Just the front up there. And then there's another amazing story about this. So you recognize the panther here mm -hmm. and the eye there. Right? Now look at this animal up there. So that's the back of the papyrus. There's a big gap at the top up there. If you actually look at that mirror version, here at the level of the gap, in there, something's written. And that is the label that's missing at the top here. And this is what it says. Isn't that a great story? <laughs> so there we go. With, with Thanks to the materiality and to, to, to playing with the materiality even through the digital, we were actually, well, they were actually able to recover a lost label from, for one of the animals on the back of the papyrus. So that was the first thing, materiality, visual perception, the embodiment interaction with the, um, the embodied interaction with the document even through the digital. Now, the next bit is, well, what is another instinctive strategy that, that um, scholars adopt? They tend to trace, to trace and draw the text as they're seeing. They use tracing as a way of knowing what the text is. Now, the reason why this is really interesting is that if you look into the cognitive sciences literature, there is such a thing called pure alexia. Now, pure alexia is something that occurs after some kind of brain accident, brain hemorrhage, um, stroke, um, the cerebral vas vascular accident. Um, what it does, it's also called word blindness. So it's a loss of the capacity of reading, but not of writing, when it's pure alexia, not writing, so it's not agraphia, without agraphia, and without aphasia, that's pure alexia. You just, no impairment of speech, no impairment of writing, but you can't read. So you can write, but you can't reread yourself. And this has been known to, to, to um, in 1892 already, Dejavina actually discovered that some of his pure alexic patients, it was possible to, to give them some form of rehabilitation by having them trace the letters 
in order to read them. So that kind of shortcutted the, uh, the, the, the visual aspect and tapped into their knowledge of the letter forms through another way than the usual visual way. Through physical um, motor engagement. And actually there have been another number of, of, um, of uh, studies that have shown that reading activates the premotor cortex area. So this motor process seems to be really important. Um, now, it seems also that familiarity is a pre prerequisite, right? I mean, if you trace something that you've never seen before, it's not going to help you read it. If you don't have a knowledge of the language, how, how would that influence things? Um, well, what do you think happens for a known script? This is a proto-elamite tablet. Now, proto-elamite is not, is an undefined script. It's a language from ancient, um, it's a script from ancient Iran. The corpus is relatively small, and they still don't really know how to read it. But, in the cognitive sciences, they've me made experiments with what they call pseudo-letters. Those kind of pseudo-letters. And they ask their subjects to learn those pseudo-letters. Three ways to learn them. By writing, by tracing them, by typing them, the custom made keyboard, and by just looking at them. Well, actually, those who typed and wrote, those who wrote tended to make better, to do better, but those who, who typed also did anyway better than, than those who actually just learned by looking. So it could be argued that when the proto-Hilamite specialists draw their texts, they're also working on their familiarity aspect. That might be teaching something else, right? There might be learning, there might be some semantic thing going on there. So just quickly to talk about proto elamite this is, um, so it is a yet undeciphered script from ancient Persia. Um, it is contemporary, more or less, to proto cuneiform in ancient Babylonia. Um, the corpus is rather small. 1,600 clay tablets um, with approximately 10,000 lines of text. Um, now, when I was told it's an undeciphered text, I thought, well, they really have no idea what it is. That's not entirely true. They've got some ideas, right? They are accounts and tablets. Um, they're, not, they're not really tabulated, but if I were to dictate an Excel sheet to you, and you were to write it as I'm dictating it, that's what you would end up with. They know how they're <coughs> being flipped around from one side to the other when it's for the total or when it's for continuation. They have a rather good idea of the numerical system because it's been loaned from proto cuneiform So that also tells them where are the entries. It gives them, um, it gives them delimitators for each of the entries. And this is how they work with it, right? So they tell you, okay, this is one bit and there's a count in there, and this is another bit and this, there's a count in there. It, it means that, for instance, um, if we go back to this one, um, I think these are numbers, and then that symbol, actually it's the other way around, because it's count, they count this way around. And I don't, I don't know my numerical symbols well enough, so I can't, I can't tell you really. But basically, you've got numerical symbols known in the middle bits that they're not entirely sure what it means. It might be a flower, it might be a knot, it might be variations of cereals of some kind. Um, and these are, these are the, the units that we saw here. And what they tend to do a lot, and I think that papyrologists, will, paleographers and, and epigraphers will recognise that, that process. Um, so then we've got comparison between various types of avatars, right? And we've got an ancient avatar, it's an ilio uh, We've got a still from an LTI, and we've got a hand-drawn copy. They're all avatars, right? Um, well, and there, and actually the symbol that the idealized model of the symbol that's in the square is the one at the top there. 
They call it M391. They don't know how to pronounce it. They don't have any kind of phonological clue to what this symbol is. But it has a code name. And they draw parallels between texts as you would do in pathology, with Greek pathology, with Coptic, with Demotic, with just any ancient language, um, where you expect to see some symbols after a specific one, where you've got specific formulae, um, where you expect one thing to be followed by the next. There's not just a semantic aspect, there's a phonological aspect, and they tend to interact with each other. Now, in the case of the proto there's there is no phonological knowledge. But here, we have quite an interesting case of interaction of the phonological and the, um, and, and the, um, and the semantic. Um, there is, in cognition, well, the model that pathologists talk about when they read this is crosswords or hangman, right? Some letters you've, you've identified, you recognize, and then you've got some blanks. You're not entirely sure what they are, so what, what do you do? What do you do when, you, when you've got a blank square in a, in a crossword puzzle? You kind of you do the same kind of thing. Well, how are my words constructed? What kind of, what kind of vowel, what kind of letter do I expect? This is this vowel, this is a consonant, and, and how can I you know, close down my, my, my space the space in which I'm doing my hypothesis to kind of, how can I constrain it in order to come to something? Well, phonologically speaking, it has been shown through crossword puzzle and word retrieval type um, exercises that semantic memory is most facilitated when syllabic units are available. That can be also paralleled with what, um, what Matt Lennon and so that was a Bob Bloom and Post, um, and Matt Lennon and Hummelhart have actually shown the word superiority effect. Have you heard of the word superiority effect before? Basically, um, we are much better at recognizing a specific letter if it's in a word than if it's on its own. Much faster, too. So you connect that, visually speaking with the phonological aspect of things, where if you send things out, that might also give you cues to what might be your missing letters. You intertwine that with semantic memory and, and your, your knowledge of the words or your expectations of what, what symbol follows what other symbol, and that's the kind of thing that will help you identify the words. Now again, familiarity seems to be a bit of a prerequisite. Um, and here is an example with the, uh, with the, with the Frisian Knox tablet, where that squiggly letter was really, really, really puzzling, because, well, it looked more like the 4th century A than like a 1st century A, and the problem is that the rest of the text was a 1st century text. But if that wasn't an A, there was no A in this text. Where were the A's? Until one of the papyrologists sounded this one out and said, well, in 1917, he read them as E's. Would that be quinhetus? Oh wait, is that the very, very bottom? That, that's, that's supposed to be a name. Could it be hard? What a joke. It even might be quadratus. And it was really uttered as a joke. Quadratus all of a sudden made sense. But then if that was quadratus, that could become ad quem. And that became actum all of a sudden everything was starting to make sense. But that was typically a combination of phonological and semantic memory, of phonological feedback loop and semantic memory interacting with each other. And this is actually how I saw it happen. Now, if we take it one step further and we, we think of um, the undeciphered scripts, there is something quite strange happening there. Now, there is such a thing called an artificial grammar learning paradigm. It's a very simple, well, very simple, I don't know, but very small. It's a way of, of creating words according to specific rules, where the rules are summarized by the state diagram up there. That just says, I can start with an X or with a V. If there's an X, it can be followed with an M or with an X. 
and the M can be followed by an M, or an M, or an M, or an X. And then an R, but not a T, or an M. So it gives you rules of constructions of a word based on an alphabet with just consonants so that you remove the phonological side of things. So your memory is not going to rely on the phonological aspect of things. It's not pronounceable. The only thing that you'll have is a pattern. So the subjects are presented with lists of words from this grammar. They don't know it's from a grammar. And they're taught to <coughs> learn it. Then they are presented with another list where they are finally taught the list you just learned, it followed rules. On this new list, can you tell us if it followed the same, the, those words? Can you tell us those that followed the same rules and those that don't? And actually, it turns out they can do it pretty well. But if you ask them, why do you think this word belongs to this grammar or doesn't belong to this grammar, they tended to draw on those kind of justifications. They'd say, well, it's random, pure luck. Or they'd say, well, it's a bit of a gut feeling. I had the intuition, I don't know, I can't really say. Or it looked familiar, which is already a little bit more, you know, there's, there's an element of memory in there. It's not, it's not just the gut feeling where you're like, I think it's, I can't tell why I think it is. It looked familiar. And it's like, I, I remember, I remember I, I saw that word before, because there were some duplicates. Between those, um, between the, the, the list, they weren't exactly the same. But there were some overlaps. And rule enunciation, I can tell you, it, it's part of this specific grammar because it follows such and such rule. Now, what's interesting is that this draws that is unconscious knowledge. This is conscious knowledge, and memory straddles both, right? And somehow, if you look at proto-elamite. There's a lot of that happening. They know what follows what, not because they can pronounce it, because they can't, but because they're familiar. They're drawing on their expertise based on memory and how, how much they remember from the previous days, as in the example I showed, I showed earlier. So, slowly wrapping up. Um, what did I show you here? Well, we've got visual perception. Um, which actually has an impact, um, which, yeah, which, um, which draws on the materiality and the rematerialization of the digital aspect of things, and that actually informs paparologists and papers in, in what they do. You've got the motor processes that the physical engagement in drawing that, uh, that allows you to access knowledge through maybe not enunciating it, but actually recognizing through tracing. And then you've got oral processes. Now, if we, if we look at those, those are all sensory feedback loops that interact with things like semantic memory and the acquisition of structural knowledge. So being exposed to the text, even if you actually can't read it, is already helpful. Um, now, how can that be fostered? How can we, how can we support that? Well. The thing about scholarly knowledge is that it is characterized by the fact that it's supposed to be communicable, right? So unconscious knowledge is not really helpful. So how do we make that knowledge conscious? Um, how do we transition from the unconscious to the conscious? And usually it happens through a aha moment, it's the light bulb moment. Um, and if you look at all the uh, literature on creativity, well, a number of triggers for that aha moment have and have been identified. One is the relaxing of self-imposed constraints. And if we think back to the shape of the A in the Frisian Ops, that had to happen, because that A looked more like a 4th century A, the 1st century text, it doesn't make any sense. You have to get, you know, you have to get away from this. You have to say, okay, well, maybe the classification of the letter shape is not quite as set in stone, no pun intended, sorry, um, as, as we might have originally thought. Um, that's, that's, that's one of the ways. Reframing of the problem, defamiliarization, task switching, and self-cueing. Now, the self-cueing is interesting because that sends us back to all those sensory feedback loops that, that we'll be talking about, the drawing, the sounding out, and the, the, the embodied interactions with the text. 
So how can we digitally support that? Let's get back to the digital a bit. Um, well, the self-queuing, the self-queuing from, from the feedback, from the sensory feedback point of view, um, one thing that would be really important to do is support the drawing and the tracing, right? Those embodied involvement with the digital avatar are really helpful. So we need to be helping to the, <coughs> the drawing and the tracing. Sounding might be helpful also. Visual triggers, like the way we digitize, if we're looking at 3D text, RTI is a perfect thing to go for. Um, task switching, encourage flexibility, support non-linearity. Non-linearity is a very typical thing in, in, parapolo in parapolology. And defamiliarization and reframing, I think that, that is something that needs to happen collaboratively. In collaborative contexts, it's much more likely to happen than when we're all working on our own, on our specific little thing. So to summarize, I think that the digital medium brings our attention back to the materiality of the artifacts and the performativity of the act of reading them. So the text is not just a text, it's a shape, it's a sound, it's an object and it's a meaning. And it's all of that. And it's because it is all of that. And actually, scholars make sense of those texts. So the perceptual processes, which are often intuitively drawn upon, um, and mobilize actually reinforce all the cognitive feedback loops that involve both perceptual and conceptual processes. So, in my opinion, the future of the digital humanities is cognitive. I think we need to bring the human back into digital humanities because, well, if we start understanding the cognitive involvement, then we can allow, we can actually optimize the use of the digital and support in particular, the embodied sense-making practices. Um, maybe not port them, but find, find a natural pendant to them in the digital world when we're interacting with digital avatars of those textual artifacts. Um, digitization, for instance, and capsule strategies of interpretation like we've seen with RTI and this parallax motion, uh, monocular parallax motion for 3D perception. Um, interactions with the artifacts which would be otherwise impossible, like tracing. Um, if, if you talk to someone like Roger Tomlin, who's actually a great um, artist and who draws, does amazing drawings and paintings, um, he used to have his tablets on one side uh, with a magnifier and his drawing next to it. Now he's delighted with Photoshop and layering. I mean, you know, there's a bit of a learning curve, but now he can actually have multiple photographs that he can zoom in and out of, and on top of those, do the drawing. The only thing that's missing for him right now is a way to do that on an RTI image. That would be great. So that's something that we really ought to be thinking of doing. Um, and then virtual rolling of the papyrus. Um, I tried actually with virtual rolling, but it was way back, a bit back, some time back, and uh, my machine wasn't very happy with it, which is also why I ended up printing everything on two, on two transparencies and playing with it, which proved really helpful actually, because when I came to, to give a seminar on it for Jim Batista in, in one of his uh, sessions, I had it with me too, and somehow it's much more convincing than me just throwing my, this is the equation of a spiral, and you have to trust me, that's this is the way it works. Actually, maybe I need to kind of fix it a bit, but it, it's more convincing as a, as a material object that you can handle. And then I'm, I'm really intrigued with the sounding. I think the sounding is really, really important, and, and I'm not entirely sure how the digital can help with, with that, but if you have ideas, please, fire away. Um, so, again, bringing the human back into DH, I think humans have really useful expertise um, expert cognitive creative powers that cannot be dig digitally emulated. What I would be really interested in is to find some ways of supporting, triggering the right cognitive processes at the right place to help them do what they do best. Um, the digital is always mediated by humans, so it is interpretative. And I think understanding the cognitive involvement will allow to optimize the use of the digital. 
And then I'm going to throw a big stone in the puddle there in the middle. But I think that well-rounded humanities scholarship is something that involves the digital humanities, where the digital is really good at transforming data into information. But the human, and that's the cognitive part, is even better at transforming information into knowledge and meaning. And for that very reason, I do believe that the cognitive and the digital humanities need to converge and talk to each other and, and do things together. And this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a an incredible, extremely interesting, um, very wide-ranging presentation. I can see people in the room's minds being, in some cases, painfully um, <laughs> Sorry. as the as the, I didn't um, mean to. the time. I know that's brilliant. I think mean, that's uh, that's wonderful. Um, does anybody have any uh, questions, comments, objections, etc. to kick us off? Yes. I, I have one question about the mathematical equation yes. that you put up there. How much math do you really need to know to do a project like this? For the virtual rolling? Well, yeah, it looked really complicated. No, I just made it look complicated. Okay. Uh, well, I bought it. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of pies. Okay, yeah, the, the reason, that, that's why it looks complicated. If I go back to it, um, I can go through it in more detail, it's really not that complicated. The thing about a spiral is that if you want if you want to have an equation for it, you have to get away from the x and y axis. Because the x and y axis can't allow don't allow you to do that. So you need to go into that coordinate system where it's array, where it's an, an an angle and a distance. So instead of characterizing the point in, in a plane by an x and a y axis, mm -hmm. what you do is that you characterize its position by its distance from the zero. So that puts it on a circle. Mm. And then an angle. And that tells you where exactly on the circle it is. And that's what this is. So it's using polar coordinates to describe a spiral. This is why the pi is there. It's just pi as a number. Mm -hmm. Um, theta is the angle, and R is the ray. So there it just tells you that, hmm. that the, 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 the wider, as, as, as you swipe the angular bit, your ray is increasing regularly, so that when you go all the way round, it has thickened by G. This is all it's telling you. You did make it sound easy. I'm not sure it's really that easy, but... <laughs> to be fair, the complicated bit is this way. Well, you can have that, yes. <laughs> okay. And, and then, and then the, the finding the correspondences. This is, this is a bit more touch and go. Um, a, a lot more touch and go. But, yeah, the equation, the equation of the spiral itself is, is it's just a different coordinate system. But the question is, how much math do you need to, to do a project like this? Well, I can tell you, you need ASL maths. That's right, so. or, or you just get second end to help with this bit. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> but I mean, this is, this is school level maths, so just doing something imaginative. Yeah, I mean, the integrals, no. Um, the integrals, I don't think you can, yeah, that, that's, that's about the length of the coils, and, and that does involve integrals with polar coordinates, and that's a bit. How do we convey? to people from the humanities, some that requires an advanced understanding of maths, of science of some description, even image processing, for instance, that requires uh, to know what engineering and these kind of things in a way that is convincing, in a way that someone says, you know what, I trust you. Or can I just say you made it up? I don't understand it. So I'm not a person that I can see that, so oh, yeah, it's math level that I can do almost understand. I don't. I confess to me that is like the language of the print on the mic. So I can figure out those letters and some things I know about, but the meaning completely escapes me. Yeah, yeah. So how do you, this is a general question, how do we make something that is, uh, for you is obvious, 
for you understand it, but to me that I don't understand it, but how can I trust you? That is, um, Do I have to trust because you? Because I've shown you the, the result. No, yeah, the point is that it's not a magic but, 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 but I think that's exactly the point. Yeah, it is, that's what I'm trying to um, say. You're absolutely right, it's, it's very tricky, and I think it's at the core of that cross-disciplinary exchange, is. right? Um, I mean, we've discussed that in detail with, uh, with, with Peter at uh, the... Uh, I did the same, so that's why I can come back to this question. The, the, the first time, coming from the medical imaging area, the first time I spoke to papyrologists, and they told me, and paleographers, and they talked to me about the features of the script, that really puzzled me. Coming from image processing, for me a feature, is a profile, a step. It's, it's a curve that describes how colour changes in an image. So from that point of view, some writing on a white page, it will be that. But the feature, the paleographical feature of the script is not what I will be detecting with my image processing feature. So there is a terminology thing going on there, very clearly. Um, and I think, I think we all need to be very much aware that even, even when we use, I mean, look at the word ontology, talk to a philosopher about an ontology and to a computer scientist about an ontology. They're not going to be happy, neither of them. They, they won't agree on what it is. Although, deep down, they converge somehow. It's just the way they use it is so different. The way that the way they handle it in their everyday practice. That's so different. is this just a namespace space issue? Is it an, it, well, it's not just an. It's a language issue. Um, it's a communication issue. Um, so yeah, you can you could boil it down to a namespace issue, but that would be a computer science way of yeah. Yeah. The, of, of actually describing the problem. Yeah. Yes, it would it would be. Yeah, you could call it an in-space issue, but I, I, I think it goes beyond that. I really think it, it has more to do with, um, with the capacity to spot when the words you're used to using in a certain way are used in a different way, and that's not always easy. Does that make sense? Looking at that equation, I mean, yeah. I, I'm not, I've got no clue what's going on in that equation particularly, although I do have a level of math, but um, a long time ago. I could, um, I, I could probably figure it out if I, if I really needed to, but I don't, I don't think I really need to. Even if I really care about the placement of the text and so forth on this, and, you know, you could, equally, you could make this up and, you know, whatever, I'd have to go through and test it and measure it and whatever else. But, um, as a historian, I'm used to believing what a scientist says about things based on mathematical um, calculations that I don't understand. I'm used to accepting um, the word of someone who's done carbon-14 testing without necessarily knowing anything about radioactive decay myself. Um, because scientists agree on that. They do. I mean, this, it's, it's more, it's a problem if, if, if the humanists distrust it because they don't understand it, then it's, it's a problem of, it's That's more of a political problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But now only is that I can verify what you are sure, showing. So you can, I can trusting yeah. is not if you times I saw the most beautiful manuscript transcribed this is the text and I'm not showing anything no, 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 absolutely. and I cannot go and see the manuscript. This is not but, scholarly method, is it? No, trusting it's not. is not no, what no, no, it is about. If someone says this is this is the case because of this statistical or um, in this case um, al algebraic um, calculation. Um, and you don't understand the algebra, but you can show it to two or three other mathematicians who do understand it, and they say, yes, this is all right. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, you, that's why we trust carbon-14 testing. We don't have to go through and test the method every single time, because we know, we know it's an established method. If, if people don't trust this as a method, that's, yeah, the, that's the, the issue we have. Part of the problem, though, is that so they were saying earlier, there are assumptions that you don't even realize we're making, mm -hmm. if we can't articulate those assumptions, mm -hmm. yeah. then how can we write the, the um, yes, yes, yes. Uh, if I don't realize you've taken out one of those yeah. ones, then you don't have to explain what we do next. And then we lose the situation. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, see that the argument could be reversed. I mean, I could, I could, I could also say, well, this specific 
this one papyrologist tells me it's not a bill of sale of an ox. I mean, why would I believe him? Well, I've got another bunch of papyrologists who told me actually it makes sense what he says. It's no, I, it's not, I, I agree, it's not the scientific no. method, no. but I think the consensus, and, and this is also why I was insisting on the fact that it's interpretative, but the thing, it's the same thing in the sciences. The only thing is that we're co the scient scientists tend to cover it up with formalism, right? But the formalism, what the, what the only thing the formalism has done is given us a common vocabulary where we don't fight too much over what it means. What I'm trying to say is that probably you're right when you said it is the principle of collaborative and interdisciplinarity. We need to change our culture and perspective in the sense that we have to collaborate and yeah. therefore accept that all the science come in, in, in working with us, that they are being. That is a, is, a, is a change of the approach. I didn't say that I don't trust you because I don't trust you. But I said, how can we do it together as a discipline yes. to really do advanced collaborative work and how we can convey that the, 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 the is the heart of collaboration, isn't it? Yeah. But that's exactly one of the reasons why, I mean, I, I, I mentioned rather briefly at the beginning that I adopted an ethnographic approach to looking at what pathologists are doing. It is ethnographical, but I didn't do any interviews. I don't believe in interviews. People talk about what they're doing. And it doesn't mean I don't trust what they're telling me. They, 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 they tell me what they tell me in very good faith. But they're retelling the story of something that has happened. Whereas if I put them in a collaborative context where they're talking about it, then and working on something difficult, then that will make some of the implicit stuff explicit. And this is why I thought that ethnomethodology for that specific kind of context is much more interesting than interviews and talk about protocols and things like that. So the other thing is that experts are notoriously bad at explaining what they're doing what, and why they're doing it. And it doesn't mean that they're bad at what they're doing. They're really good at what they're doing. But it's so internalized. Yeah. And I mean, that, I mean, if, if, you, if you read a, um, Kahneman and Thinking Fast and Slow, it's exactly that. I mean, that, that two, you know, you've got, you've got the automated bits, and that's all, all the embodied stuff. It's all automated, it's all intuitive. You just, you just draw upon it because it's instinct. Your instinct tells you, oh, I see things better if I bring, if I bring that, those grooves and stuff at eye level and put it in, in raking light. It's, it's, it's exactly that. So I think that you're absolutely right. Collaborative is, is crucial. And it's in a collaborative context that implicit things will become explicit. And that's what will help and support. Um, yeah. I think, if anything, we have a problem with people trusting too much in this sort of thing. I mean, someone will look at an RTI image and they'll say, oh, I can see things in this. I haven't been able to see with the naked eye or with, or with 2D photographs. This is great. But they don't stop and think, well, wait a minute, what, how much of this is a construct? What, what algorithms have created these things that I can't see with the naked eye? They call the black box track. Yeah, I and mean, it's not a black box because it's <coughs> all open source and people could get in there and look at it, but, um, but well, they, they, don't, they don't even ask. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's funny that you say black box because what I'm doing here with the cognition aspect of things, I'm actually looking at pathologists as a black box. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to understand what's happening there. And then I'm trying to find some bits of the pathologist black box that can be helped by the computer black box. How can we have those two black boxes kind of become grey and work together properly? That's, that's the, whole, the overall idea, really. I mean, there's still a, there's about 10 years of research in there. I mean, this is so, I mean, barely cleared um, the beginning of, there's so much more to do. Not quite sure how to go about it, but it's just fascinating. So in some ways, one of the best things about collaboration is not what we can bring to each other, <coughs> but it's forcing each other to be explicit about what we bring to our own research. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's my take on it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I found it very, very interesting the way that uh, you have cracked the code of interpretation when we read the text. That is difficult. I say, okay, this is all the stages, so you can guess for based on letters and things like that. We're not very good at explaining well, how we do it. 
but we do all the things you say. So going out to get a cup of coffee, smoking a cigarette, coming back, oh yeah, that's a bee, and this kind of thing. So I did find that to say making explicit our processes uh, helps when you are in a, uh, in a um, interdisciplinary environment. Yeah. I found extremely, extremely useful. Thank you. Thank you. To be fair, I've talked with some some um, some colleagues also who are very worried that um, the pathological expertise will disappear with, with their senior mentors, and they don't know how to teach it. There is no actual. How do you teach pathology? What do you teach? I mean, you can expose your students to texts. You can help them out on the textbook. What kind of skills would you need to teach them? And I think that kind of research might be helpful that too. I hope at least. I think John Batista actually has very good ways of teaching mm -hmm. pathology by simply using it. You know, taking this letter from this bit of the column um, and then moving it over in another layer to compare it with another form of the same letter and, uh, and then to see whether you can use uh, this to, uh, to, to disambiguate a doubtful letter and you can do the same with fibre matching. But it does require a generation of pathologists to become comfortable with the digital tools. And we are now at the moment where senior pathologists for the most part, at least in Oxford and London, uh, actually are. Um, but, uh, but it is a transitional generation, and if there isn't another generation coming along behind that can take those tools and work with them in an even snazzier way, then they, the chain of pedagogy is liable to get broken. Yeah, I think a lot of the younger scholars are probably more, more Luddite than their mentors were. Um, a lot of them. The case of the text, which was unknown, and which you turn out a little while, you read from right to left. The text was out there. Uh, an the ancient um, language. Proto Elamite, yes. Yeah. You, you said it has a small corpus, it's about 1,000 something, isn't it? Yeah, 16, 1,600 um, tablets. Uh, I mean, you, anybody looking at that would know roughly when it was done, they yeah. would know where it was done, so yeah. they would have comparisons in their mind. But other languages, other texts, certain surrounding areas and before and after, those sort of things. Um, given the relatively small number of things, could you throw the computer part at it? That's exactly why you can't. Okay. Um, this, is, this is often a question that I'm asked. I mean, can, can, you, can you just use some statistical stuff to try and crack it? Well, the thing is that the corpus is too small. You don't have enough occurrences of those symbols to actually come up with a, with a statistical model that, or, or a statistical outcome that would be solid, that you could justify properly. Um, it's, it's like all those machine learning uh, methods that, that, that you hear about. They do require a lot of learning, and there, there's not enough to learn on. So yeah, it's 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 very tempting, but it, it, even with, with the other the, the other, as I say, contemporary texts, well, well, the problem with the contemporary text is that they, that script has only been used there and for that yeah. for that for that area. Um, so the only thing they idea. know is yeah. about the numerical yeah. symbol. Yeah. So, as far as language, we don't even know if it's if if, if it might be. Yeah. It probably would be another language, but it's a different script, and the only bit of the script we understand is the bit that was alone from ancient Mesopotamia. So yeah, the, 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 the fact that the corpus is small is a problem for statistical uh, methods. I, I was struck by the symbol which is sort of for uh, north, south, east, and west, the four points. Uh, yes, it, yes, it came another place yes. As well. It's a numerical symbol, that yeah. one, I think. Yeah. Um, it struck me that if, if the whole thing is written right to left, it would always be written right to left, so to speak. Oh, you, there's a funny story with that. Please. Um, there's a really funny story, which is that in the first session I went to, they all had uh, drawings of, of, um, of just line tracing of a couple of, of those tablets. There were about five or six in the room. One here was holding the, 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 the sheet, landscape. One next to him, portrait. The one next to me, kind of on a diagonal. No one was holding the sheet of paper in the same way. I was utterly confused. I, d I had no idea. But how, how, do you, how are you supposed to read this thing? Where does it start? How do, does it go up? Does it go down? Does it, how? 
So I asked, that's, that's the amazing thing about being in those sort of sessions also, I can ask all the naive questions I want. Um, and that also is a way for me to make things explicit, actually, asking the naive questions. Um, and it turns out that in proto-cuneiforming, cuneiform, which are contemporary and later, um, the tradition is to publish texts written from top, left, down, like this. They know that in terms of um, the scribes, at some point in time it was written like that, and earlier it was written like that. They don't really know why that 90 degree rotation stuff happened. They know that, I think they know that, because I, I also got really confused about this. So this one would start on the upper right hand corner there and swipe this this way. But it would be published 90 degrees turned this way because it's the convention. Yeah. In contemporary period, it's the convention because later texts would have been read this way. So there's, there's a really kind of many layers of um, ancient and contemporary where the, the current, the, the contemporary convention follows the knowledge of about a century ago, assumed that the writing direction was the same, and then they realized that actually there had been a 90 degrees rotation, but the convention in publication is still to turn things around. So, and, and they don't really know why in time um, that rotation happened. Because the tablets haven't changed that much, the, they don't really know how the how the imprints were made either. They're not entirely sure if it was reeds or if it was. They're not quite sure of the of the instrument that was used. Yeah, lots of questions about proto and uh, I'm still about fuzzy around the corners about it. But. In my mind, it's the right-handed. The, the, the proportion of the human beings who are right-handed comes in. Yeah. That's really interesting. <laughs>